Okay, so I'm here today with Adam Golding. And Adam, I came across you um, because someone, one of my volunteers, sent me a picture of the, your platform or your, you know, your alliances platform. And they said, take a look at this. And I looked at it and there were some really interesting things that in there about transit and vacancy tax and some really cool ideas that often politicians are afraid to uh, put forward. Yeah. And then I looked up your alliance. This is called the Municipal Socialist Alliance, I think. Yeah. I looked it up and I saw there were some council candidates there. And so I thought, oh, I want to hear more about it. So that's how I'm in touch with you. So thank you for agreeing to uh, come on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And um, yeah, I was uh, I, I enjoyed watching you in the debates last time. So it's a pleasure to be uh, participating directly in the, you know, because we do need new ideas and you know, people who have actually are having ideas need to talk to each other. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, did they see the platform on a poster? Or did uh, they have, a... uh, you know, it, it was like a little, I think a one page flyer. Maybe it wasn't. Yeah, I may have handed it out. Yeah. Yeah. As well. Yeah. So that's, that's great. Yeah. And as I was saying earlier, I've been campaigning in the negative against John Tory uh, for quite some time now. Because, um, you know, of, uh, uh -huh. well, well, this leads into what, uh, what I think. Yeah. Let me about. start. This will lead into my first question, Adam. So let me start. Tell me what you see are the challenges in Toronto from your own perspective. Right. Well, from my own perspective, um, I went to U of T on loans. I'm, I was an excellent student. I was a two-term student president, and I stayed there for 10 years learning everything I could because I knew that was my only shot because I had no money. Not really, not mm -hmm. much, a little bit, um, very little. Um, and so um, coming out of, uh, of U of T, I saw the class difference between people who were there because they could afford it and people who were there because they couldn't afford not to be there. Right. And there was a huge class. And I saw this a lot in student politics. I, I became familiar with the housing market in Toronto first through the struggles of people that I knew in student government who had trouble finding places to live, this kind of thing. But it was not too bad for a while. And, you know, I remember when when I first came to Toronto, OSAP was really unmanageable and they did increase it. And then I learned that was one of my first introductions firsthand to like the politics of when you increase a benefit program and why is it a step function? Right. Mm -hmm. Like, why, why isn't it just indexed to inflation or, or, or indexed to local costs of basic needs? Um, you know, uh, we have the technology to do that kind of thing. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And um, also, um, you know, in student government, there was also over prescription of medication due to corporate, like big pharma, to be honest, because uh, I was in student government at a time when over half of the executive uh, was prescribed speed, uh, you know, whatever, or something, something either like speed or like written for quote unquote ADHD. But a lot of students at U of T wanted that for performance and they also had chronic sleep deprivation. And so there were corporate interests there. And so I saw a lot of people harmed by the mental health industry, actually, mm -hmm. when I was when I was a student president. And I saw people facing this housing crisis. And I saw the process by which people are, are um, pushed into specialization out of economic necessity. They come in as creative, curious people, very capable. Um, they're burned out and uh, economically coerced into specializing, which mm -hmm. is why we don't have creative people coming up with ideas for literally everything. Everyone was uh, forced into quote unquote their lane a long, long, long time ago and had people tell them you stay in your lane. And I got out of my lane when Tory sued Khalil Sabre, but we'll get to that later. Uh, yeah. So, and one of, one, of the, one of the people who worked with me in student government, um, a close friend of theirs, um, ended up living in the Trinity Bellwoods in Camden. So over, as the housing crisis got worse, the social network distance between U of T student government and living in Camden was one. It's not a game of Kevin Bacon. It's a game of, oh yeah, that person we all know, uh, right? right? Um, and I think many people have had that experience and it's made it a lot more real for people because they start to understand, even if it's not them personally, like, you know, after um, I, I had other health problems, I suffered from tendonitis, so uh, I couldn't play piano for two years, although that was my major instrument at U of T. And so, you know, stress and overwork issues and that kind of thing. And uh, I was on medical OW and never went on ODSP because I was afraid of the benefits traps, which I understood to exist. I even tried to explain to my caseworker the perverse incentives they were giving me to not report income and things like this. And they look shocked Like no one ever tells them. The people receiving benefits never come in and tell them, hey, you're giving me a perverse incentive. Um, but maybe they should. I mean, not. I mean, they really, I'm sure others have told them this, but they seem right. to have uh, told someone this, but these people look like they were hearing it for the first time. And I thought, really? I've heard this thing for years. This is the whole debate about benefits is whether the incentives are perverse. I mean, of course, mm -hmm. I'm coming from more of a psychology cog sci background just in my other studies. 
uh, which makes me understand behavioral economics as like more what's actually going on, which is what e economics eventually figured out that it's the incentive, stupid, not just it's the economy, <laughs> stupid, right? Yes. Um, uh, you know, not to be ableist, but sometimes policy is very stupid. Um, so, uh, you know, I've not been homeless, but I've been close a few times in, because the rental market got so bad. And I've seen many other people uh, fall that fall prey to that. And I'm currently blessed by rent control. Um, but I'm living here in Kansas City Market. Uh, luckily, I've been here about, you know, seven years longer. So, you know, I, I, I'm blessed by the memory of a market which is gone. And mm -hmm. um, long ago, before I got really involved in this political scene, in my old interviews, you can see me ranting about how rent control needs to be changed. Uh, this is an interview I did, the first interview I did with Ariel Friedman. And uh, later, the NDP proposed this very same thing. They almost called it uh, real rent control, which would mean uh, that there isn't a perverse incentive, speaking of perverse incentives, to evict. Because right now, if you evict someone and someone else moves in, you definitely make money. And that's a perverse incentive. You, you sh it shouldn't matter if it's a new person. The mm. old units should be kept at the old prices subject to inflation. And new units, here's the thing, I was actually saying this to Gil on Sunday at his bike ride, because the topic of rent control came up. And I said, look, when I work on the phone for the ONDP and the NDP, which I did the past year, you know, year and a half, um, you know, this, this topic came up a lot, the, re the rent control thing and the subject of what the Ford was doing, because he, he was removing rent control on new units. Now, the thing is, you can understand the incentive there. What the conservatives do understand is, or what they're focused on, at least, is the incentive to build. And reducing rent control on new units does create that incentive to build. But it doesn't mean you have to let the old units become more expensive. They're old, shitty places to live anyway. So it's, it's like, you know, you can get money into the city and build new units by not having rent control on new units, but you need better rent control on the old units where there is no perverse incentive to evict. So that perverse incentive affected everyone I knew in the city. Right. And it's, it's really just a simple rule change and it doesn't actually cost anything. Um, so anyways, th those are some of the challenges I've experienced. Now, I should go on to mention that it was also very challenging when... Um, well, these encampments existed and I knew people were supporting them. I was starting to see murmurs about this group called ESN, which later became, you know, activist group of the year, uh, according to Now Magazine. And you started seeing the signs going up, we support our neighbors in encampments. And I, I knew, I knew, you know, things, there was, things were shifting in some kind of way, you know, it, it, both in the negative and the positive, I guess. And um, I, I started writing to government. I, I, cause in, in general, I thought, well, you know, there's not enough of a communication between citizens and government. And what can I say? One of the challenges I faced is getting anybody to write back in any office in a meaningful way. Or if you call mm -hmm. them in, everybody is powerless and like conditioned to feel like they can't do anything. There's learned helplessness in every single job at the city based on everyone I've talked to uh, or fear of like their superiors. There was a lot of fear at the NDP of uh, you know, certain people there and, you know, uh, hierarchical structures and all that. Um, and so eventually, you know, there was a, there came a point in time where I found myself emailing Mike Layton saying, why aren't you going down there to stop these mass encampment evictions? I mean, come on, you'd at least get a photo op guy, but like also it's wrong. And like, mm -hmm. and, he, and he would be like, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm just a voter on council. I'm, no, you have soft power. What are you talking about? Do you really think the police are, are, are going to treat a city councilor the same way if they stand in front of the bulldozer or the claw or whatever it may be, the proverbial or the wall of cops that came in there? So, I mean, I'll, probably most listeners by this point are quite familiar with what happened at the series of mass encampment evictions. Um, yes. But, you know, I, I was uh, assaulted by star security at the Alexandra Park eviction. I, I could have been uh, arrested at Trinity Bellwoods and I was arrested at Lamport Stadium and assaulted again and the police stole my bike. Uh, which is that's a personal challenge in itself. I mean, I've got a new bike, but bike theft in this city that's a big that's a big challenge yeah. too. Sometimes it's the cops doing the bike theft, and uh, you know, there's like a picture of them ripping the bike out of my hands, and they still haven't gotten it back to me. So, I'll tell you, the day I'm elected, I'm gonna go right down to the cop shop and see. So, guys, about that bike, <laughs> get your bike back. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I wrote the mayor right after that. He never got back to me. He doesn't give a shit. And um, yeah, I mean, and the other the other perverse uh, the other challenge in terms of how my own life related to policy is I did briefly work at a Canon clinic and I could have been picked up in the project Claudia raids as well. And so I've seen a few waves now of authoritarianism. Also, I lived in Kensington. I saw the shops being shut down and the cafe stuff. And, you know, I, I consume weed for chronic pain. I understand it as a medical issue and I, and how it's just a cash grab and all this stuff. And at any rate, so I've been personally subjected to the threat of uh, authoritarian, you know, uh, violence, mistreatment, uh, by, by, uh, John Tory through his 
project Claudia raise and his encampment rates. And so I need that guy out of there. He's not my mayor. Hmm. So those challenges you're saying, I think, I, I, first of all, it's really interesting what you said about rent control. And I think that's something would be an excellent message to get out there is the difference between rent control for new and rent control for old. And I think, you know, you could probably find some alliances with landlords and developers and that sort of thing on that issue. Yeah, especially municipally, um, because the parties can't say it. The NDP right. isn't, isn't willing to say that Ford is right on the one side and Ford's not willing to say the NDP is right on the other side. Right. That's they won't, right. They won't that, do it. They just won't. Partisanship. They basically said they won't do it. Yeah, and I had another uh, I had another guest talking about rental and the difficulty of housing and it's 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 so um, pervasive in Toronto absolutely and that helplessness you're talking about that feeling of disengagement um, and that and that um, negative encounters went with control right with top down control yeah. um, it's something I also feel strongly about. Um, and then the encampments, you know, encampments are so interesting. I wrote a, an essay looking at it from a few different perspectives. And to me, whatever your perspective on encampments is, there's to me never really uh, a mass eviction like that is is never the way to go. And right. Anything that is involving violence and conflict, and, you know, it, it and, and it doesn't solve the problem either because people will just come back once that skirmish is over. So, uh, yeah. And it just, you know, yeah, I made yeah. that, I made that same point about mass evictions directly to the city saying that their uh, timeline of mass evictions caused all this violence because they didn't realize that people have a conscience in this city right. and, and it's not an option when you have a conscience to be like, hold on a second, you know? And so there's a certain number of people who, you know, they, for them, it wasn't an option. And this, the people at the city don't really understand that, or right. maybe, maybe they're starting to. You know, right. I, I, I mean, I told the police at the at, at uh, after Lamport, I was like, I'm a conscientious objector. I was because they asked me if I had religious considerations. And I said, well, I was I'm the first atheist in my family, but I was raised Christian. And what you're doing is ungodly. And I should have seen a look on their faces. They also told me, asked me if I had mental health concerns. And I said, yeah, the way the city's treating homeless people is making me lose my freaking mind. And right. I was, like, can I talk to a counselor? And they're like, oh, That's no, we don't cute. actually have a counselor here. I'm like, well, then why right. are you asking? You know, you don't actually right. care. Right. Uh, right. So, yeah. so absurd. Yeah, no. So I love that, I, you know, I, it's making me crazy at some times. It can be, get easy to, to feel like, where does mental health right. uh, start, mental health. you know, where does it start? Um, so now let's take us to the vision. Right. Like, tell us about how, how you see Toronto could be, or, yeah. or even where you see it, where it exists. What's your vision of what it would be like? Yeah. Big well, ideas, big change. Yeah, well, in broad strokes, we are... Um, we have a problem with authoritarianism and we have a problem with basic needs. The authoritarianism has been on the rise under Tory and especially since COVID. Politicians have lost their sense of control and are seeking to regain it by being heavy handed. And, uh, you know, they also lost their sense of control with the legalization of losing. Mm -hmm. and, and it's about that, you know, my mother didn't want me to be a politician. She didn't let me watch City Hall as a child. She said they're all dishonest and she said these people are all control freaks. And she's absolutely right. John Tory is a control freak. Most of these conservatives are control freaks. As with the general point about economics and behavioral economics, you have to get into the psychology of these people and the psychology of these incentives. And these are authoritarian um, uh, people, <laughs> using my language carefully. And um, so what we, would we it spend, look we like? We spend when... money, right? And yeah. this comes to the police budget because we spend a lot of money just to be controlled, not to make things safer but to be controlling, to enforce power. It's about power rather than safety, but it should be about safety rather than power. So mm -hmm. you'll see on the platform one point where, um, you know, I'm, I'm an anti-authoritarian who, you know, has had police and military in his family, but I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't think the police should be doing most of what they're doing. The police should be focusing on things like domestic violence. The use of weapons for nonviolent crime is inexcusable. You should never send police to an encampment because sleeping in a park is not a violent crime unless you know, if someone there has a gun, then okay, send in a cop with a gun. That's different. Mm -hmm. There are other laws for that. Um, the police should only address violent crime full stop. There should be no police involvement in anything which is not confirmed or at least suspected to be a violent crime. And we all know what that is. And we all see what the police are actually doing. We see them every day. They are not out there hunting down predators. They are giving you and, you know, friends of mine a hard time every day. Um, they are doing the bidding of the mayor and the city manager's office, even though officially, oh, well, the mayor doesn't direct police. Well, we know what's really going on. And I mean, he also doesn't officially direct council, but as you know, folks are just tweeting about, 
Um, Tory whips the vote successfully all the time. That's what that's what Gill was saying. He doesn't need a strong mayor system, but on the next council, the conservatives might need a strong mayor system because there might actually be a diversity of voices pushing back. So anyway, we can't have authoritarianism like this. We can't spend money being controlling. This is what we do with encampments. We also have to fund basic needs first. Now, this vision does include the federal government in the big picture because, look, if we had a good relationship with the feds, we could say, look, we control the printer. We have a fiat system, modern monetary theory, yada, yada, yada. What are we printing money for? We just printed a lot of money. Most of the money ever printed in U.S. and Canadian history was printed in the last couple of years during COVID. But what did we spend it on? We printed all this money and we're still not covering the basics. Mm. Um, so we need a Maslow's hierarchy approach to budgets. We should, in fact, just sit in city council with a freaking Maslow's hierarchy right there on the screen and be like, okay, first of all, do you agree with the hierarchy? Now, that discussion. Okay, because there is some interesting discussion about changing Maslow's yes. hierarchy. Actually, look it up on the Mindscape podcast. It's really loud. I'm going to go inside. City construction. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're right. placing a water main. At least they're. Can... Those people are doing real work, not the private security that they send to parks. But... <laughs> Um, what was I just say? I just lost my memory and I walked. Um, so to, yeah, start with the Maslow's hierarchy. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so yeah, if you go to the Mindscape podcast, there's actually two episodes I'd recommend: one on Maslow's hierarchy and one on corruption in politics, in which they actually suggest using sortition. But that's a whole other topic. But anyway, um, you, so you need to fund the basic needs first, and that's pretty simple. If if you're sitting beside the printer, you say, okay, we're going to print for basic needs because yeah, printing can cause inflation depending on what you spend it on. Like if you print money and burn it doesn't cause inflation because it never really didn't affect anything else but you might end up causing inflation depending on how much unemployment there is and all that um but even if even if printing the money does cause inflation inflation hurts primarily the poor because inflation is the worst if you can't get your basic needs met inflate when people talk about inflation they're not really talking about like like a i don't know luxury boat getting more expensive they're talking about bread i just had yeah. a conversation today with someone who was like oh my god eggs are so expensive these are just people i'm talking to every day and it's so so the thing is, so if you print money for basic needs, you cover that biggest issue with inflation and you make it more of a tax on the rich and less of a tax on the poor. Because that's the problem with the quote unquote stealth confiscation of printing money is that th that tax affects the poor uh, disproportionately when we, you know, we do need things like income tax. We can't just print money and have this implicit tax, but it's a bit better because it's a quick fix. People are really going to argue about the income tax. But as we've seen, they won't argue that much about printing money. We printed it for serve, so we can do it. Um, we can do UBI. Um, so we, ha we have to, basically, we have to print money for basic needs. But as a municipality, that involves negotiating with the province and the federal government. So what do we do? We can't print money. Well, we take the money we have and we fund basic needs first. Then when we're asking for more money, we're negotiating from a better position. Because if you go to the negotiating table and you're starving or your people are starving, well, they're not going to come to the table and come to bat for you in any kind of decentralized grassroots way, which is what we want on the left. We're not authoritarian corporate overlords. So, you know, um, so yeah, we have to fund basic needs first. Then we're in a much better negotiating position with the province and the feds, and we can't be so authoritarian. So that, that's the broadest vision. There's a lot of specific, if you want to get into any particular uh, policy No, I, I think that's great. And I, I like what you said about what can the city do because the city will often to me often say oh we just need more money from feds and province and i think if we tended to what we needed exactly like you say then we mobilize our population and then we can ask for and also not only that we can model it because the province and the feds they give us money from time to time and they can uh, with some legitimacy say well i don't see you covering those basic needs you know yeah. so i think if when we can solidly stand up and say look this is what we're paying for this is what's lacking um, the province and the federal government are more likely to listen. And, and it's the same with taxes for that matter. You know, someone was just uh, say, said this to me, um, paying a premium price for a discount city or something. Now, I think I think Toronto is wonderful, so I don't like to use the, you know, discount city. That sounds harsh. But at the same time, that is a sentiment that people can feel. So again, if you show we're spending the money on this, you can see it. And now, how would you like this? And if you would, let's let's raise this tax or let's look at this or let's look at this user fee. Um, you know, yeah, if, you, if, you if you defund the police by 50 percent, you can fund housing and you could cut property taxes, for instance. That's one thing you could do with the money. Yeah, well, and what, what you said about crime to me, um, I think is really interesting. Not not so much um, like and looking at it to me from positive angle on the police is we as a city really kind of say, OK, police, it's your job to, have, to make the city safe. So, of course, they're trying to do a gazillion different things instead of, like you say, focusing on this 
just finding out who did it first of all so we can you know like for finding out afterwards intervening like being available at the 911 call like being away for those violent uh, interactions where we need police protection someone who's trained and knowledgeable understands so that's where we need police but it's like as a city we're when we don't meet those basic needs when we don't realize crime prevention is about healthy neighborhoods that's what prevents crime. Then we can take that burden off the shoulders of the police and they can do the jobs that they're paid for and we can, that, that they're paid for and trained for. And we can do, as a city, all of us can do the jobs of, of mental health support, of um, you know helping people who are you know, homeless people, people experiencing yep. homelessness. There's a lot of jobs that we really, I think a lot of people expect the police to do. And so it's no wonder that there's some, to me, mismatch of priorities. And so I think if the city could say, yeah, you know what, the important jobs for police are these ones. And these are the ones that we would be very upset about if the police don't come when we call 911. So why don't we focus on that and deal with the encampments a different way? Deal with uh, someone who's you know suffering in the middle of the night. Yep. Uh, why do they need a police escort to the hospital? I mean, the police are all sorts of people are working on these issues, but so much more could be done to uh, to shift how we we allocate yeah. resources. By by the way, on on that point of well, speaking of encampments and neighborhood crime, a lot of people have this stigma in their minds about encampments and crime. I went to this meeting of Glover's homelessness work group, and a researcher was explaining that the spike in crime only happens once um, either shelter beds or encampment beds, et cetera, go past a certain density per neighborhood. Mm. But actually most of the beds are in a very, very small minority of the neighborhoods, whether we were talking encampments or shelters. And the, so it's actually not a shelter versus encampment issue in this case. And um, the services are also very centralized. So if we spread out services and, you know, even activists I've talked to who aren't on the government side agree with this idea of limiting the density of encampments. Like once a park gets to a certain density of like you have a lot of tents there, you might want to tell somebody, hey, it's probably better if we start setting up over here because this is getting really dense and people are going to start fighting or, or whatever. You know, think basically, you know, like a bike theft network operates or whatever, but that's past a certain size. And so the point I'm making is is not about about, you know, oh, people because people do things out of necessity, but. Sure. And, and they were forced into those positions. But the nimbyism is causing its own complaint because the nimbys who say not in my backyard, and then they point to the evidence of the of the crime, whether it's imagined or not. Um from the actual numbers, if you if things were spread out and the nimbys weren't so nimby, their argument would the premises of their argument would cease to be true. Because the mm -hmm. crime rate, you don't have that crime rate, uh, that spike in crime rate. And once you it's actually they, they, I, I forget how they how they sized the neighborhoods, but it, I, interestingly enough, it was like just past a Dunbar number worth of, worth of people uh, in per neighborhood. And they actually had a plan to implement this knowledge. They said, OK, we're going to put uh, little homes in green pea parking lots, um, kind of like Khalil's uh, vision, uh, but, you know, in, endorsed by the city sort of. And and they had all cost and they said, look, we've got the money. It's actually really cheap um, and uh, it will reduce crime and, without yeah. using guns. But guess what the problem was? The building code. The building right. code. The building code said actually you have to spend ten times as much money. Right. But the building code doesn't apply for to the null structure with no wall, right. and no wo no roof. Just, That's just, fascinating. Yeah, just like there's no cost if somebody dies from exposure compared to the insurance premiums that happen if there's a tiny shelter fire. Right. Unpriced externalities, just like the climate. Right. Okay. I, I want to follow up with you after this call about that about that building code and the, and the green pea because that's to me an example of where the city's its own worst enemy. Right? Yeah, you know, ask Chris Glover actually. Yeah. It was it was his. Uh, he'll know who the researcher was who was at that meeting. Yeah. So Adam, now take us on a little bit of the path that you've you've um, come to or had to be able to work on these things, to be able to put forward this vision and anything that you're that you're happy that you were able to you know make make this happen, you know, mm -hmm. make make this better world happen. Right. Right. Well, let's see. I'll I'll. I'll go far back, but go very quickly at first. Um, so I mentioned uh, my mom didn't want me to be a politician. I wasn't allowed to watch City Hall as a child, but uh, I eventually got around to it. I watch it sped up now on YouTube. <laughs> Occasionally uh -huh. I go in person, but it's easier to watch it at home. And, um, uh, you know, I um, I grew up, I was born here. I grew up in Barrie. Um, I didn't know my father. He died from lung cancer when I was uh, one year old. My mother was a sort of hippie artist, and she lived in Rochdale College. And uh, my father had been an English teacher. 
And uh, so I had definitely kind of radical influences, but also I lived in Barrie because that's where my mother moved back to where my, my grandfather had worked for Base Borden and he'd previously been a police officer very briefly. And my uncle also, uh, Neil Herdeby, is an OP, OPP officer up in Aurelia, who an overpass got named after. He's, he was affected by violence against police officers, which really affected uh, my family. Um, so uh, as much as I'm a far leftist anti-authoritarian anti -authoritarian activist, you know, um, my mother also suffered domestic violence from other men before and after my father and police saved my mother's life multiple times. She um, switched sides against her own boyfriend who she had Stockholm syndrome for and testified against him and put him away, making him one of the first dangerous offenders in Canadian history. Um, mm. at the, this is the time when there were fewer than 40 in the country. Um, so I'm very familiar with the actual role of police. And a lot of anti-police activists um, may, well, may or may not be, I don't know their experience, but, but I, I, I do find sometimes, I mean, there's probably a lot of people who know this completely well, but I hear other people uh, who talk about a hundred percent defund in a very blithe kind of way. And, and I have to tell them, look, you're not really taking domestic violence seriously. If you're talking about a hundred percent defund mm -hmm. or, or you're just being rhetorical. And so we've had this debate a lot of the socialist lines. We kind of keep it 50%. Okay. So that was early, some early childhood experiences and, uh, uh, I came to Toronto, back to Toronto for university. I studied uh, music composition originally with piano, and I branched out into uh, math and philosophy and cognitive science and AI and got into student government. Uh, I was a student president twice there. I talked a bit about that experience um, already. Um, and after that, I was actually recruited into the Pirate Party, which I was going to mention earlier when you were talking about the ranked ballot ideas. And I have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of ideas of what we can do to vote differently outside of the main voting system. Um, and so do a lot of people actually. So I'll, I'll be in touch with you about that. We could do a whole episode about alternative voting systems, <laughs> mm. um, which is what we need. Now we have kind of a farce right now. We voted on Toronto's official tree. I don't know if you heard about it. Tori no. gave us, <laughs> I watched Tori's speech about <laughs> Toronto's new official tree. And he gave a speech about how important trees are to the city. And they're, you know, the canopy is a big, important part of the city. I'm like, okay. And, and <laughs> I thought like, okay, but like, I was never arguing against the importance of trees. I don't know who you're trying to convince with this speech. Right. Right. It's just like, it's a complete distraction. I'm like, look how, look how much we listen to the people. We had a vote on the official tree and the people were heard and there was an oak tree. And so, you know, as I mentioned uh, in another uh, piece earlier, this affects nothing, but it costs money. And so we might as well spend that money on votes that actually affect things. But the people who are, you know, holding the reins of power with an authoritarian mindset don't want that. They don't want feedback from the people. But so which is why you might have to do it separately, as separate elections. So anyway, uh, student government into the Pirate Party briefly. I went more in a theoretical direction studying that and focused on music. I've always been uh, organizing events, uh, parties and so on. I've been organizing a lot of concerts lately. I run an open mic in Little Italy now. And so I always, I like the saying that politics is downstream from culture. And so I really focused, however I could, on cultural organizing and uh, developing my own uh, cultural side of myself because I felt that it attributed a bit while I was doing intellectual stuff and political stuff mm -hmm. at school. And, but I always knew I'd get back into politics um in one way or another because you know i'm a person in a country but um <laughs> and and you know I, one of the things i studied was analytic philosophy so i've applied that to my understanding of arguments in the popular media and uh, apply that to my understanding of I, i'm you know i'm going to learn more about the boring details of the law but people often lose the moral argument in, in the they they, they 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 can't see the moral forest for the legal trees uh, a lot of the time and so mm -hmm. I, I've, I've kind of deliberately delayed my legal education which I'm going to be pursuing a, a lot more uh, now as it becomes relevant to specific motions and proposals but I also you know I studied software development I can understand all this stuff it's it's code um, uh, which is what I ended up doing af after um, uh, student government I, I taught computer programming taught music theory I taught I tutored formal logic many years privately and I currently run a business, uh, Anarchist Piano Layer, Anarchist Piano Lessons in Kensington Market, where I used to do house concerts before COVID. I haven't really started that up again yet. I've been doing an open mic in Little Italy. Um, and, and so anyway, I was doing this cultural stuff. I knew I'd come back to politics one way or another. And I was always tr trying to stay interdisciplinary, like I was mentioning earlier, because it's I think it's politically oppressive to force people into single disciplines, which was part of our, our sort of mandate in the cognitive science student executive, which is to get all these different disciplines to talk to each other, to avoid reinventing the wheel. And it's very difficult, actually, because there are these perverse career incentives to specialize and focus on your journals that you need to publish in and yada, yada. Um, but so I was always trying to stay inter interdisciplinary. 
And I was learning uh, sort of politics myself on the foundation of math and philosophy and all this other stuff and thinking like, well, you know, we're supposed to be doing this in a way in which like someone with a general education can understand politics just from popular media without going into the journals and stuff. So I thought, okay, I'll do it that way. You know, I'm not going to like crack into a political science textbook. I'm just going to watch 50 news programs, you know? Hmm. Um, so I, I've tried to sort of like <laughs> pull back the veil from a lay person's perspective, but with the general tools that I got from U of T and the rest of my education. And I knew I had to shift my focus when Donald Trump won. I had an election party the night Donald Trump won, and, and I was the least surprised in the room, actually, because I'd been following closely. I watched the Rachel Maddow's coverage of the Republican primaries, and I saw the huge vote margin between Trump and all of the other people, and, well, I shit my pants, <laughs> you know, and we know what happened afterwards, and so with good reason. So I was the least surprised, but I was still surprised because, hey, the New York Times had given Hillary Clinton a 95% chance of victory. And so I felt lied to, and you know I felt lied to before, and it's I, I you know I, it causes I have to do something. Good. And you know it, it's it's um it's the disinformation age. We we've lived through the information age is over. We are now in people call it the post truth era. You can also call it the disinformation age. And I I knew that in order to figure out what was going, you know because I was watching Rachel Maddow, New York Times, John Stewart, like I was in a bit of a leftist bubble, which isn't to say I have any particular disagreement with any of those values, but it doesn't mean I wasn't in a bubble. And so from a research perspective, I was doing the wrong thing. As a logician, I had to understand which arguments were in circulation and like, you know, the whole political spectrum, especially to understand why Trump won despite having a 95% chance of victory. You know, Nate Silver was more realistic and he got tarred and feathered, even though he was kind of speaking more the truth. And so I, I quadrupled my research time in politics. And um, it was only after Tory sued Khalil Sebright that I said, okay, municipal politics is where I'm focusing uh, hereafter. Um, I then, I, to get uh, experience and help out with what was going on, I, I worked for the Jagmeet Singh campaign in voter ID and worked for the Andrew Horbath campaign in fundraising. Um, and uh, although I've been delaying the fundraising part of my campaign because we have to get actual feedback from people, not just collect donations. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the date is fast approaching and Mike Layton dropped out. So I, I probably will need uh, money to take advantage of this opportunity to give me a better shot. But um, I, my, as you say, um, there are a lot of out of the box ideas on that platform. And how did I get those ideas? I talk to everyone I can. I listen to every news program I can, right, left, center, you know, Jupiter. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, I, I've talked to every activist group that I've been able to make contact with. I've, I've met some of the people in ESN. I'm one of the co-founders of Torch. And, and I talked to people, uh, I, I made uh, sometimes, uh, some weeks, I was making more phone calls than anybody in the call banks that I worked for. And I talked to a lot of people. I talked to people when I was in student government. And I talked to people in the parks every day because I go to the public pianos that surround my ward. And uh, I, I was talking to people uh, in the park beside my house all throughout lockdown. And I've tried to listen to everyone's opinion. And so the platform that I have suggested is what the best I've been able to do based on the arguments I have collected from the rational people that the government doesn't want to listen to, which is most of us are rational people that the government doesn't want to listen to. So for the people who want to listen to you, um, how do they get in touch with you? Do they Are you asking people to join your campaign or to volunteer or to join the alliance? Like, what are you, uh, Absolutely. you people to connect? Absolutely. Well, um, we're still in candidate search mode. We need more candidates to run. Trustee, council, we were just talking about that in our in our chat. So if, if you're listening to this and you're prepared to run, get in touch with us. We will help you get the signatures if you agree with our platform. And you can see our test platform at socialistalliance.ca. There's uh, the ver the platform that I wrote is on my Instagram, uh, Adam Golding Improvises. I should put up an image copy of that of the printout that you have, but you also might, might see it put up somewhere. I've been putting it up, but... Um, it's a it's about ideas. It's, it doesn't it, yeah. it doesn't say vote for me. It's about let's talk about policy ideas. Um, so there's that. If you want to be a candidate, and we need more candidates, don't think that you're not qualified because you know, <laughs> look at how they just ran this show. It's 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 they're not qualified. Okay, so so please, uh, we need we need too many people to run. If that makes sense, too many yeah. people is the right amount. Yes, so to speak, to go a little meta, but um, and if you want to get in touch with me, my website is adamgolding.ca. I'm going to have a volunteer form up soon. I've got lots of ideas for different um, ways that people can volunteer, and you can volunteer in any way that you like. Um, I'm yeah, is you know I'm looking for creative ideas, and so don't feel like you're only going to have a few options for how to volunteer. Um, I respond very quickly to direct messages on any platform and to uh, email. Uh, I don't really answer the phone because I'm always doing music. I've always got music playing. So I was saying to the folks at the election office, listen, I know Rob. Always answer the phone. It's not how I do it. I answer messages all the time. I can talk to way more people in parallel. You only have one phone conversation at a time, really. 
Yeah. And it, when I was working on the phones with the people, I'd be having that conversation and responding to five people on the computer. So eventually I'll start a call bank and I'll be calling you, but sorry, I'll call you. You don't call me, but email me. I'll respond right away when I can. Uh, yeah. AdamGolding at gmail.com. And if you go to adamgolding.ca, please follow me on your platform of choice and also the platforms you hate because it helps out. <laughs> and, and you'll find, you know, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. I'm on nextdoor.ca, much to some chagrin. It's a funny site, very censorious, but um by the way, you're not allowed to talk about federal politics on Nextdoor, but you are allowed to talk about municipal politics. Okay. So we're walking a fine line there. But yeah, any platform, right. I have them all listed on adamgoling.ca and check out socialistalliance.ca. And tell us your writing again, Adam. Ward 11, University of Rosedale. I've lived here for 20 years. I was born here. I went to school here. Uh, I'm no parachute. And I yet to confirm that my competitors even live here. So because they've run in other wards. I mean, like the Norm's trustee ward is bigger. And uh, Robin Bucks, Bucks and Potts is... Uh, but again, from War 13, she was chief of staff over there. So I don't know which one she lives in. But um, mm. I've lived here for 20 years. And uh, you'll see me at the public pianos or uh, biking around looking ridiculous. Well, I might meet you at one of those public pianos. I'm a fan of the piano I play as well. And so... Uh, and, oh, and every we'll Wednesday... To... Oh, yeah. And every Wednesday in Little Italy in the riding uh, at 669 College at The Mix, formerly called B-Side. We run an open mic. Uh, seven... Uh, 8 p.m. to midnight is the music. Come at 7 p.m. if you're a musician and want to sign up for form. I also accept political rants, spoken word, et cetera. Um, and we have a different feature act every uh, at 8 p.m. every week. So if you want to, you know, open mics are, you know, a bit random. If you want if you want to have the part that I guaranteed is good, come at 8 p.m. That's when I book a different artist every week. And so, you know, I'm also a music curator. Perfect. Well, lots there, Adam, for people to, to connect you with you on, yeah. to connect with you on. Thank you very much for taking the time and sharing your ideas and your vision and your unique perspective on, on challenges. Um, and I really, again, I appreciate the op out of the box um, platform proposals that you're putting forward. So right back at you, Sarah. That. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Have a great day and okay. have a great day, everyone. Okay. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.